Welcome to Soul Nutrition, where we discuss the various ways of nourishing our souls. I'm your host, author, speaker, and abundance coach, Raina Rose. Today's guest is Marcus Ogden. You may know Marcus as a former NFL football player who played for the Jacksonville Jaguars, Baltimore Ravens, Buffalo Bills, and Tennessee Titans. However, Marcus is also a successful keynote speaker, business coach, and corporate consultant with two best-selling books under his belt. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Marcus Ogden to the show. Marcus, it's an honor to have you on the show today. Thanks, Raina. How are you doing this afternoon? Doing great. We're doing really good. Thank you. So I'm so excited to have you on. I'm so excited to share your story with our viewers. I've really loved um, everything I've been watching from you. I've I watched a lot of your videos, some of your sermon um, at a church that you were preaching at, and I'm just so yep. excited to dig into your story. And we've been pr promoting the Well Corona online event uh, here on Soul Nutrition for the last couple of weeks. And Marcus will be one of our speakers on Sunday at, we're going to have him at 1.15 Eastern, 11 um, a.m., 11.15 a.m. Pacific. So make sure you tune in for that, sign up and save lives because we are definitely saving lives by d donating money to the child health organization through this wonderful cause. But Marcus, today I'd love for you to tell our viewers a little bit more about your history of faith. I know your grandma really inspired your faith and your dad and you've had so many pivotal moments in your life that have led you to be um, a husband and a father and a businessman that is full of faith. So yes, you know, Raina, my grandmother, uh, my maternal grandmother, she was born in Little Rock, Arkansas, and she grew up uh, one of, I think it was eight or nine children, and she was big into faith. Uh, she was big into education, but she also was big into faith growing up, uh, and my, my great-grandparents gave her that foundation of the Lord, Jesus Christ, what you need to do, how you need to be living your life in the right way. So growing up with her, when my parents divorced, I was eight years old and we were raised by a single father, but my father's parents lived in Georgia and my maternal and my mother's grandparents lived probably 15, 20 minutes away in Washington, DC. So we spent a lot of time with her and my grandfather and learning about, we had a saying, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. You know, anytime I got into like a situation where I was either angry or frustrated or something wasn't going right, she said, Marcus, WWJD, learn is to pause. And that's where I really got my faith foundation from. You know, she did an amazing job of just always being there, being a role model in my life for as long as I can remember. And I will say that what she taught me after she's been gone now for probably about the last five, about six or seven years, is that you are who you are, but you need to have faith as a foundation. If you don't have faith as a foundation, you risk putting yourself in a position where you're not going to be sustainable. And that happened to me. I remember with my construction business, I had a lot of success, but I kind of lost my faith a little bit. Um, my father had passed away a few years prior, so I was kind of living a lifestyle that wasn't shall we say, one of a good faith-driven uh, perspective. So unfortunately, I had some things that, I, that went wrong with my business and all that. But today, who I am as a husband, a father, an author, a, um, a person that's a humanitarian, and just somebody that wants to try to give as much as I can to people, I'm going to be living a life more of faith than you know, more of you know, what you need to do to have a real holistic perspective and lifestyle that's healthy and, and promotes a great, you know, sense of balance and family, faith, and just trying to be positive in all ways I can be. And I thank you for joining us. I know you've got the kids in the house and you're outside and making time for this show. We really appreciate it. I um, was watching one of your videos and I love how you talk about offering value. You're saying, you know, it's not just about this or that, but you need to give value in everything that you do. And, and that's how you live a great life as, as an author, as a coach, as a father. All these things that you do, you, you bring that tremendous value. And is that also part of that, what would Jesus do? You know, I'm going to bring all that I've got to this situation. Oh, absolutely. You know, 
Jesus lived a life of someone who was always just going to do the best he could, no matter what. If it was, again, he didn't care about personal gain. He didn't care about fame. He didn't care about money. He didn't care about any of the things that a lot of, that man cares about. You know, he cared about people. He mm -hmm. cared Uh, I lost you there. Um, a sense of normal stability. To any oh, can you hear me? Uh, I heard Jesus. Can you hear me? Uh, Jesus cared about people. I lost you then. Yeah, Jesus cared about people and he cared about the ability to bring a sense of stability and calm to any situation. And that's exactly what it's all about. That's what the value today, how I feel, it equates to what you should be doing overall. You should be living a life that gives people value and helps them achieve their best life, their goals. Doing that, you'll end up achieving your own goals. But if you're only driven by what you're going to get from somebody, how much money they're going to pay you, all that, what's going to happen is you're going to end up living a lifestyle that's not healthy and it's not productive. And you're going to end up being in a situation where you're not going to have any growth or any type of real advancement in your life. So I try to live a lifestyle of giving value to people, adding a lot of some direction. You know, if they're struggling with direction, how to help pivot to get where they need to be. And right now, through COVID situation, a lot of people have lost faith, have lost hope, have lost direction. So I'm trying to do the best that I can to just, you know, be a resource for anyone to help them pivot, get direction, and get that hope back that they can achieve what they want to achieve. Absolutely, and that's what the Well Corona event is all about, is having experts like yourself come in and for just $19, people can come see you. They would pay more, way more than that just to see you alone at a conference. And so it's such an extraordinary value you're providing to people. And again, we're also raising money for charity. So I just thank you for, for participating in that. We're really excited to have you. And I want to talk about Bringing, bringing your all and the pivotal moments that you've had. I know like with your, your dad dying, I had a similar situation. My, my brother passed away and in your sermon, you talked about how your dad was your best friend and my brother was my best friend. And I had that same kind of rocky time afterward, you know, and now we can look back and reflect. I remember someone told me the second year is actually the hardest because everybody else has kind of started to move on and you're just starting to feel what would your, be your advice to someone who is going through a major loss and you don't want them to have to fall and struggle the same way you did? What would be your advice to them? I would tell them to focus on the good times that they had. Mm. I know it sounds cliche, but I remember when my grandmother passed away and I, I kept telling myself, all right, Marcus, yes, you're going to have to grieve. Yes, you're going to have to, you know, have that difficult time. But my grandmother always said, cry for me, but then move on. She said, I don't want you spending your life uh, in somber, in solitude, in isolation. But my father was a little bit harder because he was so young. He was 57. I'm sure like your brother was very young as well. Mm -hmm. And that took a little bit more time. And you are so correct. You know, year two was that real monster year because, you know, it was really painful. Uh, I didn't have anyone to really turn to. I, I gave up football for a little bit of time and went back. And it was very difficult. So I would tell people just try to remember the good of that person and what they helped you. And really just think about this. What is one thing that makes them who they are to you? Like what's special? Like my dad, it was always about the quality time, no matter what he was doing, what was going on around him. He always gave that quality time, which, you know, I always needed to help myself become my, a, a husband, a father, and what I'm doing today. So just try to focus on really something positive that that individual who you lost is you know therefore and what is something that you can say hey i'll always remember that a part of that person and that'll always make me smile and have those good days when a lot of times i might be having some difficult days from remembering that they're no longer here at this time 
Right. And I love how you talked about your father's presence. That was something my brother, he was 24 and his friends, they said, you know, when you were with Miles, you felt like you were the only person who existed in the world. And I know that that's something that you've learned from your dad and you bring to your family, to your marriage, to your children and to your business. You bring people in your coaching and in your consulting and your speaking that presence as if they're the only person that exists in the world right now and you're here to help them live their best life. Can you tell us about when you're coaching someone and you're, you're helping them to pivot their business or to take it to the next level? How do you use that presence to really help them, uh, like really feel them, help them understand what they're looking for to help them get to that next level? So what I try to do is I tell people that one of the biggest things that helps people become successful is stage presence or that aura of who you are. And when I'm working with someone as, a, as their coach, we really focus on, well, what part of your story or what part of your content or what part of your marketing and your messaging is going to really resonate with people and put them in your shoes and they can say, wow. I'm living a very healthy, proactive life, and I'm doing business the way that I need to do business, which is with a good heart, with good intentions to help others be successful. And I think if people start doing that more, they're going to have a lot better chance of thriving in their business to get where they, from, to go from where they are to where they want to be. So I'm a big person in creating for those individuals, like you said, it's just me and them. What about your journey? What about your content makes you stand out? And how can you utilize that in a positive fashion to capture more attention of the audience that you're trying to get in front of? Absolutely. Um, as you were speaking about a little bit earlier about, you know, not chasing after money, but this is also something that you're obviously helping people to earn more of it. I think of the story, there's, there's two parables. There's one that's, that's not in the Bible and talks about two goddesses, one's money and one's wisdom. And if you chase wisdom, money will get jealous and it will follow you. But we see the same thing with Solomon, right? In the Bible, he asks God for wisdom and God gets so excited. He blesses him with influence and wealth and a, the ability to influence so much more with that wisdom. And I love how you're you were talking earlier, you know, we don't chase the money. We don't, we're not looking how much can this person make me, but how can I benefit them? How can I be a great influence to this person? And that's where they'll be more successful, which makes your business more successful as well. And as we make the people around us more successful, the water rises and so do all the boats. And so I love that you're doing this. You're right. doing this threefold. So you're doing this with individual coaching clients, with corporate, um, yep. you, you teach like corporate uh, conferences? Yes, correct. And then also you're speaking at various places, correct? Correct, yes. So I'll do keynote speaking, then I'll do like corporate workshops and or slash you know, training, then I'll do coaching and or slash consulting for either individuals or organizations as a whole. That's correct. Yeah. I was looking at some of your, um, your tactical training and your leadership, sales, communication, and management. Um, you help people in transitions. And I think that's so, having the pivotal moments in your life, you have these great transitions that you've been able to take your experiences and those to business. How does someone, um, if someone's out there, they haven't been a business owner yet, you know, maybe they've got some other experience, you know, you went from a football player to business consultant and you're doing a phenomenal job and being really successful at that how does someone take their life experiences and pivot those into creating an excellent company so what they need to do is first thing i tell people take your expertise and pivot into consulting where you don't have to carry a heavy, you know, employee payroll or an office building with, you know, all the stuff you have to put down, the down payment, all that. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of gamble. That's a lot of risk. I gambled with my construction business. I won in the early stages, but eventually I lost. 
because mm-hmm. I got overextended. It became a very heavy burden, cash burning, cash needing machine. So what you want to do is, I advise you all the time, start out with some consulting. Take your knowledge, your expertise, and pivot and start charging people a fair, comparable price to give them the knowledge that you've learned and accumulate either from school or from, a, from your experience uh, in a certain craft. You know, take that knowledge, pivot, and get into that type of business. This way you can see the market either needs your business or you need to either pivot again. And this way you're keeping your costs down. You're not exposing or risking yourself to having a catastrophic failure. And honestly, what happens is when people have catastrophic failures, I believe, not all the time, but a good amount of the time, that's when their faith is tested. And usually a lot of time it gets broken. Mm -hmm. And I can attest that my faith got broken when I lost everything in 2013. Like, why am I here? God, what happened? Why did you do this to me? Then I had that pivotal moment in the, in the fall of that year, and I realized that God kind of spoke to me where he kind of made it prevalent to me that I was the one who made the decision, and I have never once taken any accountability for anything I did wrong. I was always looking to pass the buck to someone else. Ah, don't and, God said, sometimes. <laughs> and God said, Marcus, now that you have been accountable, now that you've owned your failure, now that you've stopped shifting blame to people, you can begin to heal and start to work and figure out what to do. And again, that's exactly what I did. I pivoted and took my experiences from football, my success in business, my failure in business, and I became a consultant. In regards, I tried to do speaking, but I didn't really get it a lot of places. I kind of just did a lot of stuff. And speaking was kind of the main primary lane. Then I went down and it kind of went into other things eventually. And I got more. I got into really consulting and coaching and all that. But I pivoted into a form of consulting that was driven by speaking as the primary lane. And it went from there. So to answer your question, that's exactly what I've been doing this whole time is I've really been working on, you know, teaching people how to pivot and use their mental capacity. And then once you see you have a marketplace and you have a product and you have a service you can maybe expand upon to a actual physical store or some type of, you know, getting people involved and a payroll and all that, then you can expand in the right time. And that's kind of what I tell people, just take your knowledge, take your experience, pivot and start doing some consulting slash, you know, uh, you know speaking or the case, well not speaking, some, just do some consulting in your industry that's perfect and i love because you're right if we have all these expenses and a high overhead then really before we even get paid ourselves we're paying the electric bill we're paying the the rent on the the, place that we're in the home yeah we think that we need all these things to have a business but especially in this day and age we don't need all that stuff i want to talk about how um, earlier you were talking about have I, there you are. Um, you were talking about earlier, like really showing up, showing up um, as your best self. Is that something that you really honed on the football field? You know, you had to show up for every game, your best version of yourself, completely in the right frame of mind, or you're not going to play a good game. And is that the same? Oh, ab- oh absolutely. If you don't ever show up, if you don't ever show up, with a high intensity, with a good, you know, with a good burning desire to actually do what you need to have done, then you're already lost. And and football taught me that, that you can't show up half into something. Because if you show up something half into something, you're going to get all the way hurt. So that's what I utilize. That's how I, that's how I live my life. And that's why I tell people, live and do your best and put out your best self. I really love that. If you're not going to do your best, getting off the couch. That's right. Yeah, I love that. If you don't, if you show up, what you say, if you show up halfway, you're going to get all the way hurt. That's so true. If we don't hurt for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, that also means perseverance. And I know you have three keys to perseverance. Um, 
Would you like to tell us about those? Sure. So basically when it comes to perseverance, that goes back to the success cycle of my book, which is one, ambition. You need to have goals that you write out that you are looking for and you're working towards in order to persevere. Second one is, is going to be drive. You have to be inspired to push through all the adversity and negativity you're going to face on your journey. So you need to be prepared and have an and I to persevere consistently through all the negativity. And then it's hard work. Focus on you, not the competition. Respect your competition. Know what they're doing, but don't focus your entire soul, life, and or energy on them. Otherwise, you will literally never move yourself down the train tracks. Absolutely. And um, I know you had said, like, it's the refusal to be phased by rejection that the word no actually just means next opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. And so, 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 no, I was going to say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. And to me, next opportunity is all about positioning yourself in the right frame of mind to move forward. And it's very difficult at times when you're getting a lot of no's, but you can't look at no as your stopping point. It's the next part, the next step to you achieving what you want in life. Absolutely. And uh, the thing is we're going to face a lot of no's most likely. And if we just, if we say that a hundred no's is where we're gonna stop, that's where, uh, we stop that three feet from the gold, right? I literally got told no, no rain up for a, on 30 months of pursuing paid speaking jobs, 30 months. If I would have quit at month 29, I would not be here today. So I worked and did other things to provide for my family at that time. I didn't just, live this pipe dream of wanting to be something or do something and not take care of my responsibilities. And yes, it was a lot of hard work. But again, if you're going to be someone who wants to be an entrepreneur, if you're someone who wants to make a real change in this universe, it's going to take hard work no matter who you are or what you want to do with your life. Absolutely. Uh, we got to keep per persevering in order to get to that goal. And I love to how you mentioned you didn't sit around and wait for the pipe dream to come to you, even though, of course, you were doing the work, you were applying for all the speaking things, but at the same time, you were making sure food was on the table. You were making sure your family was provided for. Um, I think it's important for us to know, go after your dreams, but provide for your basics as well. They're, they're both important. Have you ever had some clients oh, who don't understand that? Oh my God, yes. I've told clients like, you cannot try to pursue your dream, right? Or your passion or career without doing the job that is necessary to take your responsibility. If you're married, have family, have kids, you chose at some point to have that be part of your life. And you need to take care of the responsibilities that you need to, to make sure that you're doing your job as a provider, either a father or mother, doesn't matter to me. You know, you have to do what you need to do to provide for your loved ones because they are going to be on this journey with you, but they also need to have some stability so they're not ever having to alter or change their lifestyle. Absolutely. And I know that, as I said, with Well Corona, we are donating to the child help organization. We're actually partnering with them. And I actually just interviewed them the other day. <clears throat> and to hear the stories of abuse of kids, I want to talk to you about being a father. And I know that you had just a father who was your best friend, who really poured into you. How has that shaped how you pay attention to love and develop your children now? Oh, it's everything. I learned how to be a father, a provider, a friend, you know, a confidant. And with my two daughters, they need to know that they are, their father's there for them. And I think that's what happens to a lot of women sometimes, unfortunately, 
young ladies who go through a lot of abuse or go through some domestic issues and don't leave, I think, and I could be, a lot of the history and some of the, uh, the information shows, they come from broken homes. They don't have go good relationships with their fathers, unfortunately. And I, it breaks my heart because I don't want any young woman or any person in general, but no woman at all to go through anything uh, because especially the hands of a male with domestic violence is just such a horrible situation. But I feel that sometimes some women will stay because they have been raised and not had that strong father figure support system so they could count on and lean on. So with my daughters, I want them to always know their father's there, you know, uh, in support. You know, they don't have to worry about them ye the, their father yelling and striking their mother or being a bad influence because I want them to know when whoever they pick as partners that they need to get the same respect level from that part of that show their mother because that's where I feel, I think if young ladies or people in general, young children in general, but I think really young ladies get a good perspective on what they should be dating from what they're seeing in the household. And if they're seeing someone who respects their mom and is always attentive and always there and treats them all respect, they're going to want that in their partner. If they see someone who is abusing their mom or this, that, and the mom is staying and not really making a, a, a choice to leave because that's, you know, she didn't have anywhere to go, she feels. Mm -hmm. I think they become, that. that's like, I don't want to say normal, but it's acceptable. So my father's raising of me and my brother was huge in how we now, how I now raise uh, and co-parent with my, you know, with my wife uh, and how we raise our daughters today. Absolutely. And to have a loving home with a loving father, especially as a little girl, you know, we see so many girls out there and the problem of human trafficking is so bad right now because there's little girls out there who haven't had love at home. They don't have that fatherly security that they know they're loved and they know they're cared for. So they're seeking it. Right. And there's predators, unfortunately, out there that prey on the little girls who are seeking it, not to mention just bad relationships with their own peers. But even the predators out there that are finding the ones who just are so starved for love and attention because it's not happening in the home. What would be your advice to fathers out there, to parents out there in their homes? Some people are, are going crazy, right? Because all the kids are at home right now. They've got to work, keep the kids entertained, and it can get overwhelming for anyone. Right. Right. What would be your advice to staying calm and being present for your children, even when it's getting chaotic? I would tell everybody to be cognitive, not emotional. Think through the damage you could do to your child by making a harsh reaction because you're upset or because you're stressed. The stress and anxiety will go away. But if you don't give a good, healthy image to your daughter or your son, because you've made a bad decision because you were stressed, that could scar that child for life or for many, many years. So just think, be cognitive, think things through. Don't be emotional and or irrational and respond out of character because again, even though you didn't mean it, that still could be a damaging effect to your child and, and or your spouse. And unfortunately, uh, domestic violence and the divorce rate is up right now, spiked because everyone's home. They don't know what to do. They haven't really been this close to each other. And it's causing a lot of issues, unfortunately. So I try to tell people, just think about, you know, you don't want to make a really bad decision in a, in a flash because you're upset with how something's going. So learn how to process things and be more cognitive, not so uh, emotional. Yes, absolutely. And I know that you spoke about being raised with your dad. He was such an example of fairness, of um, acting in character and being fair at all times. Is there a story that you can think of of your dad where he just really was displaying, this is a lesson for you two boys in how to be fair, how to think in your cognitive mind and not get emotional. Can you think of a story from your dad that yeah, I remember when I was almost quitting football my uh, junior year of high school because I wasn't starting on the football team. And I ended up telling my dad I wanted to quit football. 
And my dad said, okay, Marcus, that's fine. I'm going to love you regardless. But think about this. If you quit today, it's going to feel really good. But tomorrow, you're going to feel even better. You're going to get to tell that coach off, here's your pads, and you can go take it somewhere. I'm done. But he said, Marcus, a year from now, five years from now, 15 years from now, you're going to really regret and live a life of uncertainty. He said, because if you quit today, and you can try to come back as a senior, but it's going to be hard to get a scholarship if that's what you want to do to play football, you're going to always say, well, what if I had not quit football my junior year? So he said, you sleep on it. Whatever you want to do, I've got your back. But don't let a coach ruin potentially the rest of your life or many years of it because you want to be emotional and be a brat and not be and be mad at yourself or him because you're not starting versus being cognitive and thinking things through and trying to find a better approach. So uh, I thought about it and I came back down the next day. So let's go to practice. And I stayed and that, and that was a pivotal moment for me when my dad's less life lessons learned helped me not make a very potentially huge damaging mistake. Absolutely. And I, I'm sure that shaped your three keys to perseverance as you grew up. I want to talk about, um, I didn't know that they're your junior year. You know, you didn't start. That had to be really disappointing. But for those out there who, you know, maybe if there's kids watching this that aren't starting right now or someone who's not getting the promotion that they had expected, yet you still made it to play in the NFL. So right. even though you didn't start your junior year of high school, you still became a tremendous success both in football and life because of this. So, so somebody out there who maybe, you know, has been going for the promotion and they, maybe their boss doesn't seem fair and they want to just, you know, quit the job and go get a new one, which might be right to do. What would your advice be to that person who is in that situation you were in and isn't getting the position to continue to persevere? I would tell that person to go have a clear, concise, direct conversation with the individual. And then at that time, you need to assess your resources and make a cognitive thought out decision. If you feel after talking to someone, a coach, your leader, your boss, whoever that person might be, and you feel it's not in your best interest after sleeping on it and making a cognitive thought process, then you move forward. But don't quit something, don't do something irrational in a very quick manner because you're frustrated at a situation and you haven't given yourself time to process and think it through clearly. So I would just tell people, be cognitive in your approach, think things through, and then figure out what's the best course of action to do from there. I love how you said sleep on it. You're mentioning, you know, your dad told you to sleep on it. Tell me a little bit about your book, Sleepless Nights. Sleep, Sleepless Nights is a is our best-selling book, which talks about ambition, drive, and hard work. And it talks about how I use the success cycle in my football career, in my first business career with construction, to today with my speaking. None of those three industries are alike in any way, shape, or form. But I use the success cycle as a way to pivot and grow and get those people and get myself in a position with those three different lanes to have success. So this book is really a roadmap to help anyone, no matter what you want to do, what you want to pursue, achieve success by a plus simplistic, very easy to follow three-step action plan of ambition, create your goals, drive, be inspired to be doing something and making a real change over motivated for a short-term gain and hard work, focusing on yourself and not the competition. If you can do those three things, you can have success no matter what you want to do or what you want to achieve in your life. That's right. And you can do it in something that you've never done before and that you've proven that time and time again, that when it's time to pivot, you reassess, you think logically through it, not emotionally. And, and you pivot and you, and if you have to pivot again, you pivot again and pivot again. Is that what the book, The Success Cycle is all about? 
that that's exactly what it's about learning how to pivot learning how to assess learning how to create a strategy how to learn how to have a tactical execution you know day by day plan it's about how you pivot and reinvent yourself to get that sweet spot for you that's your niche and never giving up when you face adversity no matter how big or how high that mountain adversity might be and right now of course people are needing to pivot more than ever so how would you right now with the clients you have coming in the consulting how are you telling people in this environment we don't know when we're going to get out of i think you know we've been in the digital age for a long time but we're more digital than we've ever been and we may stay this way we don't know um how are you telling people to really start thinking and pivoting uh, especially if they haven't been very digital before i'm i'm telling people to learn the power of facetime learn the power of zoom learn the power of webex and start getting in front of people more and learning how to get up and still move forward like you're going to be leaving for the day and get things going in that process where you're not always sitting around trying to figure out well am i going to get up today am i going to get changed i don't have to go anywhere i can work at the table no get up and still move with some urgency and create a sense of conviction and passion in what you're doing and then from there learn how to get on camera like you're doing now if you're having a zoom meeting put the camera on all these are big things you need to be doing to help you achieve the success that you're trying to do so again, just getting up, being direct, and just continuing to move forward and do what you have to do. That's what I'm telling people to do. I love it. And, and you're telling them too, um, I know Oprah talks about, for her, luck means the moment of opportunity, that, or preparation meeting the moment of opportunity. And so you're telling people right now in this time where we're becoming more and more digital, at least start preparing so that when the moment of opportunity gets here, you are comfortable on camera and you are able to have these meetings and you've already been practicing uh these web ways of communicating all right and so practice makes perfect so you need to be doing these things and make them part of your everyday ritual because like I said earlier the world could be going to this way and if you're not prepared or you're behind the eight ball you risk putting yourself always in a bad spot. So it's important to put yourself in a position where you're not relying on someone to, to do something for you or, or you're trying to get something done that you can't do because you haven't tried to move in that direction. And for you too, when you're personally at least, I don't know about in business, but when you're talk, when you're thinking of yourself and you're, you're deciding to pivot, whether that be in business or something, a decision with the family, um, how does prayer and seeking God and your faith enter into the picture when you're deciding to pivot in a decision? Oh, absolutely. It's everything because, you know, if you don't stop and take prayer and, and ask for you know, guidance or ask for what to do, again, man can make a lot of mistakes so you want to try to ask for a high, ask the higher power how can you position yourself how are you doing is this the right thing to do is this best for my family is making this move or buying this house or you know again i sleep on it and we pray about it and we have discussions about it and we make decisions together with us both thinking about it praying about it getting outside you know influence or suggestions or inclusive dialogue and go from there but prayer and faith plays a huge part in uh, me getting that, you know, um, that assurance that what I'm doing is the right thing to do. Absolutely. As you were speaking, I was thinking about the verse too, that um, the battle is won with a multitude of wise counselors. And that's one thing that you are providing for your corporate consulting, your coaching, and, and even your speaking. You're, you're being a wise counselor in people's lives. Who are some of the wise counselors? Uh, obviously, you know, your dad was a wise counselor to you and, and your best friend. Who are some of the mentors and wise counselors that you have in your life now? I have a guy in a group called NAPSA, and the guy's name is Brad Mitchell. He was the one that taught me about how to have better verbiage, 
more clarification in my message, how to, uh, how to translate, how to transcend my football terminology and talk into corporate business talk, uh, how to be much more aware with how you engage people, uh, all the kind of stuff that are the little nuances I didn't really understand or know about. He played a huge role in that happening in my life. And he is one of my kind, he's one of my mentors, one of my coaches that helps me out through this time frame that I, I'm going through, which is always trying to stay relevant, new content, uh, you know, more engagement. Because one of my uh, clients who just hired me for a webinar in May, I said, Marcus, there's a lot of people out there that are repurposing content and doing things. Well, what makes you different? I said, well, I'm repurposing content and putting out things. Yes, but I, I've lived the life. And I'm telling people what's worked in many facets of my life and not just what's worked, but how it has worked and giving you the action steps that you can apply in your own life and get things going. So that's really the difference I tell, tell people. Yes, I have content that people say, but I'm giving you my stories and why I do it to help put you in that action mode of getting it done yourself. Absolutely. And I think that your story, um, I met you on a show that we were both on earlier in the week. And I think that your story right now, I mean, going to, was it all almost homeless or, or all the way? Oh homeless? yeah, it was all, it was, it was almost homeless. We were literally down to our last, maybe like 400, we had $400 left in our account. That's all we had was $400. That was, that was it. Right. And so for people right now, knowing your story, I think, I think sometimes it's great to get perspective and I, I think it's good for everybody to have been broke at least one time in their life for many reasons. One, to just know what it's like and another to know that you can get out of it, that you can pivot, that you can make new decisions and sow new seeds and, right. and have a new kind of life. So what were some of the decisions you were making from that place of $400 left to where was the the pivotal moment there of, all right, this is what we're doing next? The pivotal moment really came into play when I, when I got my first paid speaking job and I realized that I had the ability to, to do this. But what happened was I wasn't understanding the real reason that I got paid. It wasn't just that they wanted to give me money or because I was an NFL athlete, right, reading the book. They wanted me to share my story with their group of people who, or their graduating class to help them as they were getting ready to go out into the world, if they faced adversity, how to deal with it. And that was the first time I realized that in my journey that it's not about my credentials as much, you know, from football to business, all that. That's not, I mean, yes, you need to have that to some degree. It's nice to have. But what's really the driving force is that I have a... I, I have the ability to help people because I've been through some really bad adversity from the top to the bottom to the top again to the real, real rock bottom. And I'm trying to work my way out of this. So it was really about the action steps that I was able to apply and give to those people. That's when I got paid and that's when I said, okay, this is something that I have the ability to do and I can help people get things done on that level. I love how I was watching uh, a video where you had said, I was getting all the no's when all I was saying was, hey, I was a football player. And they said, well, we don't play football. <laughs> and so you had to say, that's right. What do I bring to the table now? You know, um, I'm not going to go tackle them or something or teach them to do so. So what I'm doing now is bringing that story of here's how you overcome adversity. Here's how you win the game of business or the game of life. Um, and you were more focused on where you are now and where you're going, and that changed your whole life. I know that uh, when I was, I've owned businesses since I was 19, and then, you know, done other things, and then gone back to owning businesses, and I did the same thing. I think I was so proud of being a business owner that I would talk about that past thing still, because I was talking all about my former business because I was proud of that, and I wasn't very proud of what I was doing in that particular moment but it was also for me the same as you talk about once I started fig focusing on and talking about what I'm doing now and what I'm doing moving forward that's when the forward motion started to happen instead of focusing just on the past do you find that a lot in your clients who've had success and they're having trouble pivoting that they kind of 
focus only on the past successes instead of the, the future ones that they need to move toward? Absolutely. And they always say, well, when I did this and back in the day I did that, I'm like, well, I understand what you're saying, but back in the day is not today. And if you want to continue to move forward in your life with, with some conviction, with some purpose, with success, you've got to live for the here and now. If you're not going to do that, all you're going to do is continue to live a life where you're living in the past and what you used to do. And that's not going to get you anywhere towards where you want to be today and into the future. And that's what happened to me. I had to stop thinking of myself as a former NFL athlete that was a speaker and a coach and as trainer. I am a national, international keynote speaker, executive coach, that's something off the corporate trainer that used to play in the National Football League. And that's how I introduced myself today. I'm proud of who I, who I was and what I accomplished, you know, in, the, in my 20s and part in, the, in my 20s in my life. But it's no longer me. I'm 39, almost 40 years old. If I keep living back in my, in my mid to late 20s, I'm going to be sitting right there, never moving forward towards anything better in my life. Absolutely. Well said. We, we have to, to keep going on those future goals. And you're right. When, when we do start finding ourselves talking about, well, I used to do this, that was a good step. But we are proud of what we've accomplished. And sometimes I do encourage my clients to remind themselves of all the times, you know, that God has come through for them in the past. But this is just a reminder that he's going to do it again and that, you know, that we're going to come through and we're, we're going to be just as built up, just as lifted up as we were that last time and even more by God. And so I think that's so important what you said about being proud of it and knowing that, that God was there for us before and he'll be there for us now. One of the verses you mentioned in your sermon was um, Romans 8, 28 through 31 that all things work together for our good and that if God is for us, who can be against us? Is, does mm -hmm. that help you with your um, commitment to perseverance? Oh, absolutely. Because I faced so much adversity, so much negativity, so much spite. In the first two and a half years of my career, from everybody saying, why are you doing this? You, what do you expect? I mean, you're, you're a football player. You're not a speaker. Why would we pay you? Why would we hire you? Where's your value? What are you going to do for us? No one cares about what you accomplish in football. This is the corporate world or uh, education system. You know what it is. So I didn't have anyone for me but my fiance and her family, which is very few people. Uh, I mean, they, they're a great family, but they don't have a large family like most, like some people do. So I didn't have, you know, I had very little to almost no support outside of them. Uh, and really, other than God and the faith, you know, and not allowing myself to be broken when I was facing all this negativity, that's what got me through all of the things I was facing. So absolutely, faith and God pay, played and still does play, not as much today because I don't get the, as many no's, but I, I still know that God was one of the, was one of the few people that was there on the side of my wife and her family. I know that. And I don't forget that. And I don't sit around and just make this thing like, oh, you know, I had a bunch of friends when I started. Everybody loved me and said I was going to be successful because that wasn't the case. And that's fine. And that's just the way it is. But what I tell people is if you let outside influence run your life, you'll spend your entire life always wanting to be in someone else's shoes because mm -hmm. you're never going to get to where you want to be because you're always just going to be like, well, I, I can't get this. Well, nobody likes me. It's okay. Just do what you need to do. Know who's in your life, who matters, who's always there for you, and keep moving forward. Absolutely. And to, just as that verse said, if God is for me, then who can be against me? And maybe even more so, who cares who is against me? God is for me. I'm confident in who God has made me as an in his image, right? A creator who has creative power to pivot, to do the next thing, to take the next challenge, and he'll be with me through the whole thing. What I want to talk to you about, you have so many roles, and I really commend you for how you reach such a level of excellence in all areas of your life. And I know that your father has played such a, a pivotal role in that for helping you to become the man you are today. 
Um, but one thing that you didn't get to see with your father, I think, because um, of the divorce, is a strong marriage. So during this time when obviously date nights are kind of out the window because you've got kids with you all the time, what are you guys doing to be able to keep the marriage alive and have some alone time with each other if, if that's possible? <laughs> Great question. So we really like watching things together at night, like, you know, the first 48 on ID Discovery, or we like to watch like the Ozark. So we like Netflix. We like th like these, like, you know, uh, I won't call them doc like the live, like, you know, um, investigative discovery type shows. You know, someone was murdered, who did it, and try to figure out, piece it together. <laughs> and we like that kind of stuff. Yeah, we really like uh, uh, First 48 or Snap, something like that. And that's what we do right now. I mean, you know, we, we have our Netflix nights. Uh, we'll go for walks with the dog sometimes. We'll, you know, we'll have this, our, you know, our pillow talk nights. And, you know, that's really what it is. And that's where I feel a lot of people end up having issues sometimes in a marriage relationship like you only want someone just for what they look like and again looks are great but they fade and that's yeah. just life so can you talk to somebody is there more you know is there more is the deep connection beyond just the physical attraction and a lot of people i don't think so i feel a lot of times in divorce that people have lost if they ever had it to begin with the communication aspect and they got married for the physical attraction and it starts to wear off and then you realize you know okay well you can only look so good for so long look at the same person all day and you can't talk to them you can't have dialogue you can't have a faith discussion you can't have a political discussion you can't have a health and wellness discussion you can't have a what's on tv discussion because you really don't have any common interest and next thing you know you just start to drift apart drift apart and again, like with me and my wife, we like a lot of the same things. Uh, you know, uh, she got me hooked on, um, oh, uh, soap operas. Like, you know, I watched now with her, General Hospital. Uh, again, it, it's, it's a good show now. It's, it's grown on me after years. But mm -hmm. when I first started watching, I was like, ah. But, you know, she liked it. So yes. I think in a marriage, you have to learn how to bend, right? Don't have to bring, just bend and learn how to accommodate each other and it where you try to at least develop some type of interest in your partner's likes this way you can have dialogue and when you get into a situation where you're stuck can't go anywhere you're fine with it because you know I mean, of course you want to give people space to some degree but you are fine with it because you know that you can always talk to that person versus people who you end up not being with or all that type of stuff in the past probably where you couldn't talk to them a whole lot and next thing you know, well, well, I, well, if I can't talk to you, then I just don't think it's going to work. Absolutely. I can sense a really strong sense of respect that you both have for each other. Just the way you talk about your wife, you can tell that there's, there's a bond of, of love, <clears throat> but also respect for each other's, what, they, what each other likes and thinks and wants to talk about. You have to. If you don't have that type of relationship, I feel it won't work. I look at her parents, they've been married now for 40 plus years almost, I guess it is, 40 plus years. You know, they're great friends, they talk, they have dialogue, you know, they know each other. You know, the, the, my mother-in-law knows what my father-in-law doesn't like, and vice versa, you know, conversation. And look at my parents, they divorced after 18 years. I think it was just like they grew apart. I think my mom loved my dad, but I don't think they were able to like go out anymore. They lost that connection. They lost date nights. They lost conversation. They, I think they developed more, you know, they de developed different interests and they stopped having common things in common that they like to discuss or dialogue other than the kids. And that was pretty much it. And then they just drifted apart. And after 18 years, they were, they divorced. I look at my grandparents, my mother's parents, they were together, you know, 50 plus years before they both passed away. You know, my grandfather every day brought my grandmother coffee and, you know, my grandfather knew it that, you know, when Price is Right came on, my grandmother was going to have her, her Hennessy and Coke drink. And, you know, <laughs> my grandmother always knew that, you know, she was going to cook other than breakfast food. She was going to cook all the time. And my grandfather cleaned up and my grandfather, you know, went to work and she knew. I mean, so they, they like things together. Like they like watching Jeopardy. They like watching Price is Right. I remember, I remember watching, um, 
for so many years, you know, I stay with this, but the night it was always Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. We always watched that. And we always watched some type of like Washington Bulls basketball game. So I remember my grandparents, you know, uh, I don't know. Again, I was young. I don't know what kind of marriage they had beyond the closed doors. I'm sure it was good for 50 plus years. Yeah. But in front of their grandchildren and, all, and their people they knew, it was great. I mean, they just, they had a lot of the same interests, a lot of the same likes. And that's what keeps a marriage going. So my wife and I, we have those same type of respect for each other, the type of faith. You know, my, her father was a pastor or was a pastor for over 40 years. So, you know, that's a great faith-driven spot there. And we just have a good connection. And we understand, like right now she's in the house. I'm working on, I mean, I'm working. I've been on this call for almost an hour now. And she knew it. And I'm working because I'm trying to build a brand. And she's a teacher. So she's not really, I mean, they're going to call, they put us call school. So she's still doing things for the kids, but not as much. But I can't just sit around and, you know, it's a Friday afternoon. I have to still get things done. I have to do a webinar tonight for a group out of Utah uh, from six to seven. But my wife knows that's got to be done to build our business, to get things what we want to have done. But the communication we have is great. Because a lot of times people who are doing what I'm doing, oh, you don't spend enough time with me. Then I'm like, well, no, we do. It's just not as maybe as much because I have to work. So you have to find a party that's understanding and will bend with you as time to accommodate both sides, but not break their morals and or their values. And I want, I've been wanting to ask you this because I tell you, I asked about your wife and you just light up. And I want to know for those of us out there who are looking, what would be your, your key things in finding a strong partner to do life with? Three things. Number one, respect for me and uh, for each other. So a mutual respect. Number two, someone has a hard work ethic that understands how to, uh, that hard work is going to build up to a brighter day. And three, somebody that can empathize with you and feel what you're going through. So mm -hmm. empath empathy, empathy uh, is going to be one, respect and trust. And then someone that you know has a strong or similar work ethic that will work alongside of you. If because here's the thing, if somebody doesn't have trust and respect for you, they're gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna, you know, cheat on you, break your heart, all that mm. stuff. So that's you know, I mean, number one. If nobody, if somebody doesn't have a hard work ethic, when I went bankrupt, I just would have threw in the towel, quit, took a menial jobs, worked at Target, spent my entire life just dreaming about my old days as a football player. <laughs> but to, to but but this week. Well, next week, we're closing on a custom-built, brand-new home that, and I haven't owned a home since 2012, when it got foreclosed on. And we're That's buying us through all, the, all this COVID and this craziness, but I've always kept my head down. I've always I had, a, had a hard work ethic, mm -hmm. and I've never wanted to settle this being average. And then again, empathy. If I'm having a difficult day, my wife understands, vice versa. You know, she's kind of bummed right now because she loves her job and she can't teach her fifth graders and my first, and my, my kindergartner is not going to have her full experience. Now she's gone off the first grade without it. And then our oldest one is 16, about to be a junior next year. So we have college coming into the mix. So you have to learn to empathize with people and give them their space if necessary. So if you want to have a strong relationship, you know, trust the respect, hard work ethic on both sides, and then someone that's a part that's empathetic to you and what you're going through at that time or through those difficult times. Wow, that's, I just love your story. It's so incredible. And I love, you really met your wife during uh, one of your down times in life. And she has been there with you as you've rebuilt this together. And um, congratulations on choosing a wonderful wife and on your new home with your family. That's just, that's really a wonderful, wonderful progression that you've, you've worked hard to accomplish and uh, it's here. Congratulations. And I, and I want the listeners to know when I got here in 2013, April, seven years ago, I was flat broke, mm -hmm. flat broke, no money, no anything. And I'm in North Carolina. So North Carolina is a very, you know, it's a, it's not it's super expensive, but it's not a cheap state, but it's a, it's a good, you know, above average, you know, type of area. And then we're building a home that it's in the half million to a million dollar range development community. And when I got here, I couldn't even afford to pay next month's rent in the house we were staying in. My credit score was a 350. 
Mm. Today it's a it's a seven forty five, seven thirty five, and a seven and it's almost a seven hundred. If I can do it, why can't anybody else? That's right. You know, it's gonna take hard work. It's gonna take dedication. It's gonna take you know a lot of pers perseverance and grit. But it's been seven years for me, and I started by pivoting into my mental as a consultant, which I knew my first name was speaking. And I, again, and here's the thing too, Renee, right? I didn't get a paid job until four years ago. You think about that. I went wow. from four years ago getting my first paid job to now we're speaking all over the place, grateful for our team, appreciate everything they have, doing webinars, podcasts, coaching, consulting. In the last three years, I've spoken for 13 Fortune 500 companies, of the 13, eight are Fortune 100. Incredible. And I love, so I, yes, go on. So if I can do it, if I, if I can do it, I just want the listeners to understand, if I can do it, I'm no better than anybody else. Mm -hmm. Football had nothing to do with what I'm doing today. Nothing. I just had a dream. I had an aspiration. I figured out some goals. I figured out what I was strong, I was strong at, and I went to work, and I just kept plugging away. So if I can do it, so can you. Absolutely. And I love how uh, in one of your speeches I was watching, you talked about uh, when you tell people you need to go get a job, they say, oh, this big Fortune 500 company isn't hiring. And you say, well, Target's hiring. That's better than what I would have had. I worked for less than that when I was starting out. And so you have, sure you have done little jobs that didn't pay. And, and I've had a very similar experience, you know, where and it was in those little things when I was giving the thousand percent and all that I had to something that was, you know, way below my experience levels that I was promoted. And I, and I see how God's lifted you up and given you the Fortune 500 and the Fortune 100 companies. And you have a story of grit and perseverance to give them and overcoming. And God has given you this valuable story through your entire story. And I love that your family and your marriage and everything has grown stronger through it. And now you're coming out the other end to a new home and a new uh, level of influence with your company. So where can people find you so that they can have a piece of this too? They can find me on uh, our website, www.marcus, M-A-R-Q-U-E-S, Ogden, O-G-D-E-N.com. They can also shoot us an email at Marcus underscore Ogden.com. We're on LinkedIn, Marcus Ogden, Instagram's at Marcus Ogden, Facebook's Marcus Ogden, and then our Twitter is at Marcus underscore Ogden. Reach out to us. You know, I'm all about chatting with people. All the consultations are free. I'm not here to charge you money for a 15-minute call. And if I can't help you, oh, I'll take $100. I don't charge anything for consultations, having a discussion. If I can help you, we'll chat further about how I might be able to help you. If I can't help, that's say I can't help you and how maybe this person can. I'm not about taking money from people who I can't help because I don't want to give a service or product that will not be satisfaction oriented to the client that I'm serving. So I'm all about just value. And here's the thing I say it again, just focus on your strengths and delegate your weaknesses and plug those holes and you can have whatever you want. But again, do not be, don't be afraid or fearful of rejection. It's part of the process. If you're not getting rejected on the path to your journey or on the path as you're on your journey, then the journey and the goal is not big enough. So just be prepared for rejection and knows and be prepared for people to tell you and ask you that question, why are you doing this? What are you thinking? God has other plans for you. And just be respectful and say, how do you know what God's plan is for me? I'm going to keep going and just keep on moving. Amen. Well, thank you, Marcus. We really appreciate your time. And I just want to tell the audience, as always, until I see you again, may the Lord bless and keep you, cause his face to shine upon you, and nourish your soul.